We have a problem. One second. I hope that you all understood it now. Uh, we d had like some technical problems and... Okay, sorry. Then we have to wait and now we can start again. So welcome to our last session for today. Um, untendable stories and drinks and it's going to be a fusion of technology and bartending. And I'm really happy to introduce Matthias Bauer who is calling himself a hacker and he's going to be here for the technology side. and. Jörg Meyer, who is a bartender, and they will both show us what this fusion of technology and bartending means. Enjoy. Good evening. Well, it was a dark and stormy night on the 1st of December 2012. I was walking through the dead city center of Hamburg. If you've been there, you know how dead it is. Around 11 p.m., trying to get out of the rain and remembered what a friend told me shortly before. Somewhere around here, an amazing bar was hiding in plain sight. Disheveled and wet in an oversized hoodie and with long green hair and neither clue nor reservation, I set out to find that bar. The bar is almost invisible from the outside. There's no blinking lights, there's not even a big sign outside. And the building is rather nondescript. It's an office building somewhere in Hamburg's center. I don't really think there's a bar there. But if you go there and you spot the lion on the recessed door, you might think of ringing that doorbell, as I did that night. I had heard about the bar via word of mouth from friends. And my first visit was half accidental, and certainly without expectations. I had heard the bar was very good and rather fancy, a little dressy maybe, and I showed up at the doorstep feeling and looking more like a Lost kitty, a stray kitten, wet and messy, not fancy at all, really. And going to a classical bar on a Saturday night without a reservation is usually a surefire way to get sent along your way with pitiful looks from the bartender, from the doorman. But I wasn't. I was welcomed. Hi, I'm Matthias Bauer. I'm a hacker. I enjoy good drinks and good user experience. You know, there was a Saturday night and uh, we had a great service. The bar was very crowded. And... Uh, we open the door every time when a customer rings a bell. So the red sign, it's a red small secret sign we can see every time when somebody's ringing the bell. So the red sign was ringing and I was going to the door and I was opening it and there was a man with a green hair. I was a little bit like, oh my God, who's this? But you know, as a bartender, we are like, we are, you, everybody's welcome. So we are like, oh, good evening, sir, how are you doing? So we invited this gentleman with green hair. And um, I'm happy to, to have that done because he's the reason why we are now here after how long is it? Two years? One and a half, one and a half, two years, yes. So my profession is drug dealing. I have to say that. Uh, I'm a professional drug dealer. And um, next to this, I have another profession which is reading the mood of customers and guests every night. This is why I love my job and I think this is maybe different when you work online or when you work in the social media world because I deal with emotions very individually. So I open the door, I see every time different people and I have to judge in a very few seconds how they feel, uh, what's the mood they are in. Somebody wants to be entertained, somebody wants to be treated very low, calm. And so I try this with you now. So I think, when, when did Republika start at 10? So you're here like eight to ten hours. You have had like hundreds of maybe small talks. You meet hundreds of people you maybe know very quickly. So you had a stressy, hard day. So if I can read that right, it's time for a drink. Would you agree on that? Okay. It's very easy to play this card, I have to say. <laughs> <laughs> Believe me. So. Uh, I do this quite often. I do a lot of keynotes. Um, I go back to Moscow tonight at 12, so I have to leave at 10 to get my flight and tomorrow we do a keynote there. Uh, but normally my audience is bartender, so I just have to tell them here. Andre, the Moscow Mule can come? Okay, perfect. Um, so uh, normally my, my uh, crowd is bartenders and that always works out very good. When you serve drinks, you know, even if your keynote is not very good prepared. At the end of one hour, they love you. 
So we try, <laughs> we try this here as well. The US service industry, even if we are not very well prepared, we are very good in like uh, doing this out of nothing. So, um, alcohol is maybe one of the two last classic drugs next to tobacco. Um, but for me, there's a big difference between alcohol and tobacco. Um, and this is, for me, selling alcohol is connected to lots of culture and rituals. Smokers maybe will say they have the retail as well, I agree on that. But you, I think you don't find so many variations uh, comparing smoking to serving alcohol on drinks. Uh, and this is why I, what I love, and this is why I love selling alcohol, honestly, I have to say that. And um, always hearing these great stories or the rituals, um, for example, if you would tell me they have opened a modern opium den like they used to be in the 19th century in, in China. Because when I read uh, romance or, or articles about these old opium deans and how the atmosphere was, how elegant and how luxury and how cool, I think I would immediately start to consume opium, but not for the effect of it, just to enjoy the atmosphere of these cool deans. And I think this is what a bar is also a little bit about. We sell you more atmosphere than um, the actually effect of alcohol. So today we have many restrictions. Uh, people start to ban alcohol. Also in Germany we have lots of laws coming up and saying hmm, we need to ban this a little bit or we need to control this more. And <clears throat> uh, for me, I like to make people understand that it's important to consume alcohol uh, with knowledge uh, and that there's a big culture for thousands of years to make sure that we don't lose. For me, it's a great um, or important thing to enjoy alcohol free. It's not banned and I, I hope we can make sure that this will not be banned in future. So, I'm dealing classic drugs and many of you, I think, they s deal with modern drugs. When I come to my bar, what I see often where people are very addicted is, for example, smartphones. That's the business where you are in. Many of you are dealing with the online world, and I think this is a very modern drug, not well researched, very dangerous maybe. It can be very cool. Uh, social media and smartphones can be very helpful, uh, but there's also a very, very strange side to me, um, thinking about smartphones. I see that every night in our bar, People stop talking and they pull out their phones and they sit in front of the bar and just they sit next to each other, seven seats at the bar, five are using the iPhone or the smartphone and just, you know, not talking to each other. That is a little bit strange, if you ask me, as a guy selling classic drugs. The good thing on classic drugs is we talk to each other next, next to each other. So, I have two spots in Hamburg. One is called the Boilerman Bar and there's where Andre is from. Andre is on the moment backside. He's doing your Moscow Mutes. I hope you start enjoying that. Cheers. So, and uh, Magdalena was just here, she's from our bar, Le Lyon Bar de Paris. And I think this is what you can tell a little bit about. Yeah. So, Le Lyon is a, is a kind of special bar for me, because it was one of the first classical bars that I really experienced. And by experience, I really mean experience. So user experience at Le Lyon starts even before you, you get to the door. Um, they don't advertise, for starters. You won't find any ads anywhere, not on Google, not on a newspaper not even on the street. Um, you hear about it from friends, or maybe you read about it on a trusted third-party source like a magazine or some blog, somebody recommends it to you. And maybe you Google it, you find a web page which is, well, streamlined. Basically, there's nothing there. There's no 3D tour of the place. There's no online menu. There's no about us. It's just the logo, a phone number, email address. No social widgets, no nothing. So how can it be successful, right? Um, and then when you actually go there, you notice that from the door to the bar to the drinks to everything, the entire experience has been designed. Um, it's interesting, what well, was very interesting to me because I'm a huge nerd, is that the entire history of Le Lyon, how it came to be, how it was built, um, what people were thinking when they built it, what Björk was thinking when they were building it, is all documented online in a blog. It's a barbaublog.de and it covers everything from finding the right place to uh, floor planning. Um, developing cuisine style presentation, choosing the right lighting, wallpaper, everything, music. Um, I remember there's this one paragraph somewhere in the middle of Barbar Blog 
being very explicit about how nobody else can influence the music playlist. There's a fixed playlist and that is it. There is no, oh, I brought this record from home, or hey, can you play this 90s band? So if you, if you come as often as him, you're maybe a little bit pissed because the music is a little bit equal, you know? But I will, I will fix that. recognize some repetitions. And then you go to the Boilerman bar and you hear the same tracks in different order. Like, wait, it's a I different know playlist. That's oh, not yeah, true. Yeah, but there's overlap. I know. I asked. It's more, you know, funk and soul. The other is more uh -huh. like jazz and lounge. I asked these people. Okay. I know. <laughs> so yeah, and that to me draw from the point that design is not just about how things look, just as in technology or in, in any other area. Design is how things work and how they feel. And what it also showed me is that design is very often a story about control. Because controlling the experience is the only way to ensure that people have that specific experience that you want for them. So if you go to Le Lyon and you go to Boilerman, you will notice that they're both kind of different. Actually, they're very different. They have very different feelings, very different setting. But what I have in common is that they feel well designed. And they feel designed to make you feel welcome and comfortable. Yes, as Matthias told you, um, we wrote seven years ago this barber block. It's still online. Thanks to Matthias, he fixed it again. It was broken. And um, links will be tweeted. Yes. <laughs> um, so we, um, even if I say it's strange for me when I sit in the bar and see people putting out their iPhones where they should have a conversation to each other, I love social media. So I try to use this as much as possible in one way. But because maybe I'm very strange in this, because that is my profession, I would never use that when I have off time when I go for a drink. You know, I've just been to Moscow uh, already, so I just came in today, do the speech and go, away, uh, go back to Moscow again. And we already had four days of bartender training in Moscow. And, and bartender training is exactly what it sounds like. Yes, it is a training, I have to say. And uh, <laughs> bartender training, so four days of bartender training. And... Um, you know, I've been three years ago, I've been to Moscow and I did a roadshow, 12 cities, in, no, or 10 cities in 12 days. We trained 1,400 bartenders all over Russia. And this time, there was smartphones not so popular in Russia. And I loved this because that was the old school thing like, what happens in Russia stays in Russia. And I really, I promise you, that was one of my best, <laughs> you like that, huh? That was one of my best two weeks I've ever had in my life. Amazing. But now I was partying again, and oh, you were surrounded by everybody with smartphones doing pictures and uploading them immediately. I felt we have lost a little bit. You know, I think we have the right to have a time off, to get a little bit drunk, you know, one drink too much, I think that's fine. Uh, we have time to, to we, our life is so stressy. We need to go back and have private places. We have to create private places. And this is what I tried with Le Lyon. It's all about the atmosphere. I'm really atmosphere addicted. You know, it's about light and sound and design. So when I came here today at stage four, I was like, wow, this is a huge stage, not bad. And then I saw all the people with the headphones and I was a little bit like, how does this work? Because normally, it's very strange when you can't hear the loudness of your own voice when you do a presentation. I think that bends my interaction with you a little bit. I think it's crazy. It's okay. I try my best. But, you know, I'm addicted to atmosphere and to all these small details. So, um, but we fix that. So, Lulio is about atmosphere. I told you about this. <coughs> um, and I think... The reason why it has become very successful, we are now operating six years, six and a half, and the th first three years have been financially horrible. As a bartender, it was very good because you had lots of time having conversations with the customer, trying drinks, you know, all this free time. Also, as an owner, I enjoyed it very much, always to the end of the month. Then it was a little bit like upset because uh, you have to pay the people and the numbers have not been good. Creating such a place took us a very long time, a little bit longer than we expected. But in the last three years, it has become extremely successful. Sometimes I think you're unhappy with that, a little bit. But it's strange because we are now, now so many people and they become regulars and we can't send them away. Uh, and I think people really and like, by circumstance, I like that very much we don't have cell phone connections in Le Lyon. That was not planned, but you, most networks don't get access. I think that's really cool. So the next door bar I will open, I promise you. I don't know if there's some technology to bend this. You're, yes, Which you're my man. Yes? Highly illegal. It's illegal. 
Do we have a sponsor who's Telekom? No, no, it's, no, okay. it's okay. Okay, that's okay. So, all this, uh, Matthias told me something about in his world, maybe in your world, you call that user experience. Yeah. And we talk about user experience a lot in the technology world. And for the longest Sorry, time... Sorry, can I, can I just interrupt you? Sure. I forgot something Sorry. very exp uh, important for the user experience. Can we have the next drink, please? Right. <laughs> this is called keeping your users engaged. It's, it's kind of funny how um, I think Duden even defined user as um, somebody who uses drugs for the longest time. And only recently they changed that to, I don't know, people using technology or something. So anyway, yeah, user experience. We talk about user experience a lot in technology, it's at least recently. And for the longest time we didn't, which was bad, and now we do it a little, which is a little better. But still we only really talk about it in the context of, I don't know, web pages, applications, mobile stuff, internet technology. And even then, we don't really talk about the, the entire experience. We don't talk about design nearly enough. We focus on small aspects, and then we take that to the extreme. But we don't really look at the, at the entire picture. At best, people are thinking about, well, how do we monetize this? How do we get users to click on this ad? And how do we make this more visible? How do we sell this sponsoring? And, well, that's not really putting user first. That's not really user experience. Only slowly are we beginning to take the entire experience into account when designing. So no matter what a field of work is, no matter what a product is, thinking outside and uh, thinking outside the box and thinking quite literally about service design can lead us to new and often surprising experiences and uh, insights. So the, the question is, how do we create a good experience for the user? That's one way, definitely. That's How a do very we tell good a convincing way, story to keep people engaged? Well, it helps if you sprinkle it with drinks. And I'm convinced that this kind of thinking will always result in better products. And maybe, maybe even if we extend it to just everything, it might even lead to a better world. Bum, bum, bum. A better world. That's a, that's a big one. I cannot pick <laughs> that up. I'm going for the drama. <clears throat> so my world is very small. Uh, we started you a gin basil smash. Oh, sorry, a gin basil highball. That's the interpretation of a drink we created, which is called gin basil smash. It's uh, six years ago. It was just named from uh, different magazines to one of the modern classic cocktails of the world. And for sure, user experience on my bar is also we want to deliver you a very good drink. We know that the other drinks, uh, other other drinks, but other things are also very important. But for sure, at least you also come for a good drink to my bar. So uh, this is the drink we get very famous with around the world. This now has a splash of soda, so it's more refreshing. Normally it's a little bit more concentrated. Um, but my drink is lots about classic cocktails and stories. Um, we have one... F or other, I start other. There's a gentleman, a guy who writes about classic cocktails, a journalist, he's called Gary Regan. And he once told you, if you want to impress your date, impress your boss and impress your bartender, you should order a Negroni. And we need to take out a few learnings tonight. You know, when you leave this bar, or this stage, it's not a bar, but this liquid stage. Now it is a bar. We had a... Un <laughs> we had a... We, better, we had some unofficially bad. We wanted to become the most liquid keynote ever done on Republica. Yeah, fun I promise. Fact, uh, I, sorry. I actually, um, I put in a bunch of ideas for the Republica... Um, so, um, RFP, and one of them was um, mud wrestling, which was unfortunately not accepted. I, I, dis I disagree also. Like <laughs> That would have been the most liquid session of Republica ever, so this is the second best we can do. I'm sorry. Maybe later. Uh, maybe he has to do it without me. Uh, I'm not good at that. I'm not even wearing a t-shirt. Okay. And so... Uh, it's about classic cocktails and a Negroni, so you need to have a takeout when you leave this place. You need to t you need to know, for example, that a Negroni is a drink you should try. It's a classic one, and as we now heard, you can impress people with that. And believe me, what you should start is next to impressing your date. This is often for a short time very important, but on the long run, maybe not. Believe me, um, impressing your boss is the same, maybe more important financially wise. But very important is impress your bartender. You have to impress your bartender for some reason, because if you're cool and impress a good bartender, 
you have a friend which can be very helpful if you live in that town. I give you examples later on and you can apply. We still have uh, capacity in Le Lyon when you come to Hamburg, let me know. Um, so in Negroni, um, there was a long time ago in 1920 in Florence, um, that was the time when many rich American tourists traveled to Italy. And they, are, they have been used to consume cocktails. Cocktails have been very unknown in Europe except London. There were very few places where you, consume, where you could consume cocktails, so the, the regular Italians have not been used to this. But the Americans have been used to mix Italian bitter and Italian vermouth. So it has to be brought out of America, uh, Italy. And then the Americans start to mix it. And they came back as rich tourists. And they t started to teach the Italian waiters that they, on the terrace of Florence in the sun, they want to enjoy something like Campari with Martini Rosso. And they want to have a little bit of soda on top. So they have a lazy afternoon drink to hang around on the terraces and get a little bit drunk. And the Italian waiters started to call that the Americano, because that was for the American tourists. So the drink became the name Americano. In the 1920, there was a very famous count, that was Count Negroni. And he was Italian, but he was traveling America. And uh, he had been to the Wild West, and you know, he was a strong, tough guy. So he came back to Italy, and he was like, what's this? It's very watery, what's this? that's for American tourists, we can't drink this. So he talked to the bartender and said, listen, could you take the soda out and put some gin in? So a Negroni is an Americano where you take the water out and put the gin in. For me, that sounds very elegant, I have to say. <laughs> so, and I don't know why, because it has, you know, it has this classic and it was not too popular all the time. It's good spirits, so bartenders, maybe dates, maybe bosses, love this drink. So, but talking about Italian classic cocktails and also uh, oh, and Ita uh, so the cocktails and Italy I want to tell you some of our main user experience which is also coming from Italy and I have to look up the name I always forgot that so the guy there was a gentleman called Baldassare Castiglione Baldassare Castiglione and he wrote a book and the book the name of the book was Book of the Courtier I don't know what you, if you know what a courtier is, that's a very strange word. A courtier is a young gentleman living at the, uh, you know, at the, he, he was serving the king of Italy, so a kind of butler. And that was a handbook for the king's butlers, for the young apprenticeships. So you, they started, you know, serving the king, and that was the handbook. This gentleman wrote this service handbook over 20 years and put all his knowledge on how to treat people and how to give a king a very cool user experience, we would say today. And uh, it took him 20 years to write it. He published the book in 1528. So this book now is becoming nearly 500 years old. And he was talking about something very cool that is called Sprezzatura. I don't know if you ever heard about this. That's a very old Italian word, and he created this. It's called sprezzatura. And for him, it's all about to create something which looks very easy, very elegant, like it's no stress. It doesn't stress you, even if it does. You know? When a king asks you for something, you never have, you're never allowed to look stressy, or you're never allowed to say, oh my God, how do I do this? It's always just no problem. You have to be good prepared, and then you serve it very, very elegant. We try to do this at Le Lyon as well. For example, when we do our drinks, we try not to talk to you except you ask for it. We try not, not to make you to do a show off. We just want you to enjoy a very good drink because we think the experience of having a dr good drink will be something special for you and you will realize that this is a good drink. We don't have to tell you. So Sprezzatura for us is a very cool um, user experience. I have to say we have stolen this from a gentleman, he's called Stanislav Ratner, he's a kind of bar guru, he's traveling the world and he found this old book, so thanks to this guy, and this is our user experience. And reading about Spessatura got me thinking, um, and every time we stand exposed, like on stage for example, or on the internet, on this, uh, some social network, in this medium where everybody can be their own mass medium, we often try to appear as presatura. We try to appear that like everything is all right with us, always. Everything is always fine and sunshine and everything is great. Because anything else could be considered as a sign of weakness. 
And I wonder why we do that, because the service industry, they have a good economic reason to do that. But we as, as private individuals, we don't have any reason to exact and keep up such a facade. And if we do it, we might end up in a very wide schizophrenic split between our public personas and our real selves. So I wonder, why do we always pretend that everything is fine on a public Twitter account, on a Facebook stream and an Instagram feed? Is it because everybody else seems to be doing so well? Because the chances are that they are at the same time ranting on their, their dark Twitter, that they're whining on Facebook messages or maybe crying on a MeSpace shoulder. So who are we pretending to and why? Or are we all just simply products as soon as we go out in public? I don't know. Should we not change our own perception then to match that so we don't feel as bad? Instead of tearing ourselves apart? Can we change how everybody behaves just by changing how we behave, maybe? Or do we just need a, I don't know, a socially accepted way to be disinhibited online, inebriated, intoxicated? Maybe we just need something like, I don't know, intoxication as a service. I like that. That's a trend. <laughs> So, if you could do me a favor, if you at and least... tweet that. <laughs> what? I tweet that? Okay, that's his style. So, Mofo said something strange, like... Um, but if you can do me a favor, if you enjoy your drink and you say, that's cool, could you go... I, I'm not, I don't know how you do this. You go to Wikipedia, you go to the definition page of a bar, cocktail bar, and you... What did you say? It's a... Intoxication, intoxication as, a as a service. Can you put that in as a definition? Yeah, they, are. they, they really don't like that. Huh? They don't Wikipedia like that? Wikipedia don't like people doing that. Uh, that's okay. Look at me, do Wikipedians. Anyway. Let's do it. Come on. No I, I spend you a drink. Whoever does this, give me a notice. <laughs> <laughs> Let's make it a challenge. You change it as often back as some other. We, we do that. It can be our secret. <laughs> you know, we don't tell anybody. Let's do it. <laughs> so, um, intoxication as a servant. I like that. So, as I told you, um, yeah. where are you going? I'll be back. That's dangerous. I'll be back. You go back. Uh, bring us Negronis. I've seen they are nearly ready. Can you make sure? Yeah, sure. We want to have Negronis as well. We do our best. We do our best. Is it the green one? You like it? Thank you. So that's what I told you. It's uh, the, we created, or I created the drink in 2008 in Le Lyon. It's called the Basil Smash, Gin Basil Smash. And in the other bar, the Boilerman bar, which our concept is not classic, it's high boards and music, we put a little bit soda inside to make it more refreshing. So if you come to, uh, uh, to Le Lyon, you get a little bit quicker intoxicated service. If you come to Boilerman bar, it's a little bit more relaxed. Thanks for the compliment. So, um, as I told you, selling drugs, selling alcohol, for me, it's more about the culture and the knowledge and the company. And then there is this effect of getting a little bit drunk. Uh, and I think a little bit is absolutely okay. And, um, you know, I have to write this down. I think in, in Germany you say, Der Weg ist das Ziel. And this is for me if you go to a very good bar. Der Weg ist das Ziel. I am not sure if that's the right translation. If they say the journey is the reward. Would you agree on that? I get it. Okay, thumbs up. So the journey is the reward for going, going out for drinks, in my opinion. Um, so, I told you before, we want to talk a little bit about classic cocktails. And also, if we talk about classic cocktails, you maybe would understand what style of drinks we appreciate in De Lyon and what style of bartending we like. So, there's a very classic cocktail. It's called the Daiquiri. Has somebody of you already tried the Daiquiri? Hands up. Okay, who have had a classic Daiquiri? Not frozen, not strawberry, not pineapple, not... I like that. Who of them like the drink? That's a little bit much, I didn't expect that. The drink is amazing, but normally most bars fuck it up, I have to say that. Um, because it's interesting. The drink was created around 1890 in Cuba, and in the beginning it was just, or well, it is, still is, three very simple ingredients. So it's white rum, I think at the beginning it was Bacardi rum, and later on they changed, but it's white rum, and you have uh, fresh limes, and you have sugar. That's it. So you have an alcoholic taste, you have sweet and sour, it's refreshing, that's fine. I like, can I have one? <laughs> Thank you very much. 
So, feel free. I think we need to go to Dear Technic in the back. Did the Technic have a drinks? We need to go to the Technic. Can we do that? Yeah, I mean, because what the Technic don't get, knows yet, we try to go overtime when we open the bar for at least 15 minutes to serve you more drinks. So we make them happy now to open our bar later on. So Daiquiri, classic cocktail, Bacardi rum, and it was white rum, that's interesting. Uh, sugar and lime, Cuban classic cocktail. 40 years later, a barman called Constante Ribaluergo, that was a Cuban or a Spaniard, he was coming from Spain, but he moved over to Cuba, and he took over a bar, he later named it La Floridita. And uh, in the 30s he took that over, and in the next 30 years, he made this cocktail world famous. Before that, it was somehow a national conclusion, but no, nobody was interested in. He had a little bit of luck because of prohibition and many other things. Many, many people were coming to Cuba around the 30s, especially many, many journalists, American journalists, and he was a very good host, and he gave them a very good time, and he was a very good storyteller. So I think there have not been more articles published about one bar and one bartender in the past than this gentleman. They called them... They called him El Rey de Coctelieros, the king of the cocktails, to give him tribute because what he did was so outstanding. And his idea was to take very simple drinks and make them perfect. So the daiquiri, if it's only three ingredients, his trick was to take care about limes. So he took very simple limes and he had a special tray where he let them like ripe. So he put them in and he waited till he sees this one is fine, this one is fine. And what he did then is he perfected its uh, technique, he rolled the limes. So he took the limes and he rolled them on a cutting board, very long. So the lime have lost all the acidity from the skin. In the skin there's lots of bitter oils and acidity. So he was rolling the lime, the acidity was lost, or the bitterness. And then he cuts it and it was very juicy. So he just squeezed them by hand in the shaker because it was very juicy and it was, it was a sweet juice. Then he added a little bit of sugar and he added lots of white rum. I have to say, white rum is important because when you use dark rum, that's easy. Dark rum is a little bit, it's a cheap game because everybody will like dark rum and lime and sugar because dark rum is so much full of flavor. I think the art of doing a great daiquiri is to make a good drink with white rum, which is very light in flavor. So he was p doing a perfection on this. So he was rolling the limes behind the bar and all of a sudden the bar became very famous. So he employed bartenders just rolling limes and putting them. So he had two boys just taking care about limes. So he was the first guy who bought American ice machines, uh, which have been very special. They made very good cold ice at this time. So he took care about all the little details. And finally, such a simple drink became something very amazing. He bought some very special shakers. <laughs> oh, it's cocktail time, saying, Andre. I need a drink. Little Wait. detail, sophistication. I have no idea what he was saying, actually. Mr. Bauer, you look like a cocktail. It's cocktail time here. <laughs> you need a cocktail. Here we go. Photo op time. Yeah. So, he bought some very... <laughs> Looks good. I like the classic shoes. Yeah, yeah I like that. It's very good. <laughs> Can we do a cheers here for the gentleman? Oh, yeah. Cheers. Mm. So his, his bar became the title, the cradle of the daiquiri, the subtitle, because it was the home of the perfect daiquiri. He bought special shakers, and he in the beginning he started a very special shaking technique, big shakers, and he was having a very special strong technique to make them by hand, nearly frozen. He was not a friend of frozen cocktails, but his drink became like very thin ice chips on top. So even Hemingway in a book, I have to read that to say it uh, in the right order. So he said, the daiquiris felt as you drank them the way downhill glacier skiing and the powdered snee of the friend's Alps. So, I think that is, if you read that once, you never want to have a leaking daiquiri again. It must have ice chips on top. And I think then you have a perfect drink. So this is just one example um, for a great drink in our bar. How we try to do drinks, very simple, elegant. Um, 
and you gave us this poem of intoxication as a service. There was a yep. very good, cool bartender. What's this? <laughs> <laughs> We need drinks! Thank you all so much. Now, please take a screenshot, post yeah, it on promise, Twitter because it will be deleted in five seconds. What, what's your name? Hagen, Hagen you're, my, you're my hero. Hagen. I think the definition of bar in Wikipedia is very boring. So this is now something very cool. So, another example of intoxication as a service, which we already now have as a definition of a bar in Wikipedia, so you can trust it. Um, I have to say. There's another great story about intoxication as a servant. And um, that was around 1900 in San Francisco. At this time, there was a gold rush in San Francisco. And because of the gold rush, you had many people from Latin America coming in as, you know, there was lots of work to do so they can earn money. And because of that, all of a sudden, the spirit of uh, Pisco became the most drunken spirit in San Francisco. That was the only place in the world where Pisco was drunken so much because of all the people coming from Latin America. There was a very, very fine luxury bar, uh, the bank, and um, the bartender there, the head bartender, he used to mix a very famous drink. And that was called the Pisco Punch. When you dig in history, the drink is a little bit strange. When you find like uh, things from the past, old books and old articles. For example, there was a police law in the city that you are only allowed to have two of these drinks a day. That made me a little bit like wondering why the police is taking care about this. There was before prohibition. Why, why, why are you only allowed to have two of these drinks? Because they're too awesome. That, yeah. you, find, you find lots of... Um, like travel guides of the past where the people wrote this is the eighth world wonder you have to go here and drink one of these drinks it's unbelievable I also felt that is very strange for a drink to name like this so I started to dig in the history and I found very old articles in newspapers so this gentleman was a real you know he was behind the law he was if, if, if there was a law he always followed for example when prohibition started he immediately closed the bar he didn't want to get in trouble with the authorities. But what we found out later on is there was a very special ingredient in the Pisco Punch. Normally it's Pisco, lime, a little bit of water, uh, pineapple, and then the special sugar is called gum syrup. But next to this, there was a hidden ingredient. And this was the reason why at the last 20 years of his bar, he always prepared it in the basement with this. a big uh, lock, only for himself. He was the only guy who knew the recipe. Does anyone want to take a guess? Anyone want? You know, we can hear you. Huh? It was cocaine. Because when he started to do the drink, cocaine was legal. And then it became so successful that he decided one or two spoons of cocaine, that can't be the problem. <laughs> I mean, that's my man. Can you look up Wikipedia what the definition of Pisco Bunch is? If the thing with cocaine is missing, we have to add this. If there's anyone from Wikimedia in the audience, I apologize for the vandalism. You know, I'm from a, I'm from a different world, that's okay. That's your problem, not mine. Okay, well, okay. English Wikipedia is fine. Okay, so it's your turn, my friend. Right. So, yeah, I've been drawing lots of analogies uh, between the bar scene, bar culture, internet culture. And that, that's the reason for that. Um, bartenders are also highly connected to each other. The bar scene is just another subculture, and now it's just another subculture within this, well, World Wide Web. And so we have all the same, the same things we see on Facebook or on Usenet or on IRC, we see the same things happening in that group. There are instances of virality, of open source, of making um, algorithms and so on. Like one example is the Gin Basil Smash that uh, you had earlier in the highball version. Uh, it's a drink that was invented at Le Lyon in uh, 2007, I think. Uh, eight. 2008. Eight. Yeah. I can yeah, explain that. It was a very boring summer. Yeah. We had like was one of the first no, no customers in the first summer. So we were very bored and we played around with ingredients. Yeah. So that, that drink was invented on a boring summer and then it was blogged about. And then it spread like wildfire. First to Germany yeah. from the readers of the um, then leading bartender blog called the Bitters blog. And from there it spread around the world. 
And now you can get it almost anywhere. Uh, the various names, Gin Basil Smash, Gin Pesto, what have you. There's different versions of it and so on. And I missed, I missed to buy stocks in basil. <laughs> and I'm becoming pissed of this. <laughs> but it's okay. But what he did right um, is, for example, the concept of the ice bowl that you have on top of the bar. Um, which was also invented and published in Hamburg in 2007, published on Barbau Block. And it has also since gone to be a fixture in many bars. But here, Mr. Meyer was a little smarter and actually put a, a patent licensing fee into the drawing. Yes. Which is... So I, I made a drawing on the Barbau Block and said, listen, this is my idea to have something on top of the bar full of crushed ice. You can serve your drinks and prepare the drinks to it. And a long story to explain you all the great things about this, but it's very cool and bartenders love it and they started to copy it and I put in and said, listen, if you copy it in your bar, that's fine. You know, it's like, how you call it? Creative Commons, open yeah. score, something open like source. that. That's every, you can steal everything, but there's one license. Say it again. Here we go, sharing is caring. Don't, don't share drinks, do me a favor, don't share drinks. It's enough for everybody, it's no. fine. Well, we have enough. Um, so. Uh, the license fee is you have to pay me one gin tonic when I come to your bar and they use it. That is funny because once I've been to Frankfurt and I get drunk on 12 gin tonic. <laughs> I mean, that's a cool license fee, isn't it? I, mean. I think patent law needs to be reformed. So, yeah. Um, another thing, as, as you just said, uh, drink recipes. Of course, they're a kind of algorithm. They tell you take X amount of this and mix it with X amount of this using this procedure. And new drinks are often created by resynthesizing all the recipes, all the formulas. It can be varied by a kind of genetic algorithm, with the fitness function being the feedback from the customers or the feedback from the colleagues in a boring summer. And accordingly, now you can find drink recipe generators online and even to cocktail honest, that mixing sounds robots very unsexy. Offline. The drinks are algorithm, but it's okay, it's okay. I try it. It's okay. This is Republica, you know. Yes, you're right. So yeah, people have been doing all sorts of stuff with cocktails. There's lots of variations. There's um, people who build cocktail mixing robots from everything from Lego to industrial scale machines. Um, and sometimes they even implement genetic algorithms on the fly. So you have a robot and it gives you a drink and you say, no, I don't like this drink. Then it makes you the next drink and you say, ah, this is much better. And then it makes a drink where it thinks that you like it more. And so on and so on. So this is kind of fun, playing with uh, recipes and algorithms. And of course, just as with everything else, there's uh, communities around drinks, about discovering drinks, tasting drinks, talking about drinks, and of course about drinking. Deliberately, responsibly, but most of all, enjoyably. That's very important, I agree. Um, so, um, telling you the journey is the... No, the, the journey is the reward. That's it, so the journey is the reward. We uh, started at Lulio something which we call Bildungstrinken, and um, if I... <laughs> that's true. He's a big fan of it. I am very, very educated. Uh, because I really, really, it's it's my love to pull alcohol from the dirty corner. That's not that's not fair in my opinion. And, and that's, I hope you will uh, that, also that, be very that's educated. That's lying. Today. That's lying in public to do this because many people enjoy alcohol in a very good way. For sure, it can cause problems. No think about that. But we have to put it. It's not dirty. Alcohol is good. So. We have to it's make also disinfectant. Yes, it's also disinfectant. Yes, that's true. So we have to we, we create something which we call Bildungstrinken. Uh, when we should uh, translate that, it would be something like educational drinking, maybe. Uh, this is a small program in Lyon. In Lyon, we do from time to time where we have special evenings where we invite customers. And what we did today, we tell them a little bit tricks and stories to make them understand the elegance of drinks. Or what I think is very important today, you know, cocktails have become the new wine. Wine used to be the thing where you can show off. You know, when you go out for dinner, when you meet friends. It was always clever when you, maybe not in Wikipedia, but somewhere else, read something about wine. <laughs> so to impress people. Uh, when you're at the dinner table or you're for a date, whatever. It's cool to talk about wine. And we spotted that talking about drinks and cocktails has, to become, thing, has become something very equal. So people start to do a little bit show off, and I really like that. Because that's what we do as well for a living. And... Um, For example, we trained people in home bartending. We said, okay, this is very important. You need to know this about this gin and this tonic and some very simple tricks to use at home to make sure that you are not the stupid guy. Because there's, you know, alcohol is lots about marketing and lots of this is wrong. For example, we have this um, very elegant bottle of um, 
Henrik's gin, and it looks very traditional, and I like Henrik's gin. But on think, I think there's a label on that says from 1868 or 62, I'm not sure. And this drink was created, this gin was created in 1999 and was launched in New York in 1999. The date on the bottle is the building of the distillery of Glenfiddich, because Glenfiddich is producing this. If you ask me, that's a little bit cheating, <laughs> just a little bit. I think it's called marketing. It's, yeah, that's very near to each other. So if you, if you uh, are at home, Pulling out uh, Henrik's gin and saying, listen, this is a gin from 1868. So, and your colleagues, friends, whatever, say, come on, it's from 2000. We just want to make sure when you are a regular of our bar that you don't look like the stupid guy. It's very important for us. I, I have to take this opportunity to warn you. Because if you're prone to nerdery, to massive nerdery like I am, and you start reading Barbau Block or Bitters Block or something, and you find out all these things, you will suddenly want to buy a 15,000 euro ice maker for your home and then find out that not only does it draw several kilowatts of power, but it also uses lots of water and it's really fucking noisy. But it makes wonderful round ice cubes that you cannot find anywhere else. And you have to, you have to take them out like every four hours. So you have to like put your alarm clock like, oh, I need to take off, yeah? Like this. There's uh, so Andre, much you can do about ice. Can I ask you what the next drink is doing? I just want to make sure. <laughs> there's actually a YouTube huh? video of, uh, there's, a, well, there's a bunch of YouTube videos, obviously, but there's one that, that stuck in my mind when I was reading about um, making ice cubes. And it's uh, on the eternal quest for the perfect round ice cube. So what's your personal on, problem? <laughs> <laughs> on the one hand, there's people investing in these machines and like round ice cubes, but of course they're not perfect because it's a machine, the water has to go in somewhere, so they're not perfectly round. And then there's people who really, really overdo it. And by really overdo it, I do not mean spend 15,000 euros on an ice machine. I mean the overdoing it. So there's, there's bars in Japan, there's bartenders in Japan that actually take a huge block of ice, like this big, and they take a really sharp, really expensive, really fancy Japanese kitchen knife, and then they start chopping away at the ice block. And they chop, 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 chop for like seven minutes until they have a round ice block, and then they put in a drink and they give it out to the customer, and that's then like, wow, this is so awesome. It's also completely inefficient. Which is, which is not true. I think your research is leaking a little bit. Um, sorry to, to blame you here in front of your friends. Um, he, he's a really cool guy, believe me. I'll he's be drunk a, soon. He's a, okay. very, he's a very cool Bildungstrinker, believe me. He's very good. But uh, Japanese bartending, you have to understand that's only done in Tokyo. There is a very small district in Tokyo which is called Ginza District, the financial district. And in this area, you have up, it's just like two square kilometers. In this area, you have, you have 800 classic, six to 800 classic bars who are run by one old school bartender and one apprentice. That is a very old tradition. He's a ninja. You will never find them because they are never on ground floor because they cannot pay the rent. So you have to go in huge skyscrapers, financial skyscrapers, and you have to know which floor and which door, and behind that's legal, there's a bar. Uh, you have 800 of them in this small district. Most of them have a sign outside, we don't serve foreigners, which is not unfriendly, they just don't speak English. Some of them speak English. And in this area, when you order a whiskey on the rocks, the whiskey is like 30 euro, 40 euro, whatever, it's very expensive. So maybe it is effective in a different way. So I have a good friend, it's called Uenu san he's an amazing bar. He's speaking English when you go to Tokyo, it's Bar High Five. And for example, he's taking the crystal clear ice. The thing is, after war, they couldn't import ice machines because first of all, they had none. And when it started that they could get them, the bars have been so small that they decided we don't put an ice machine inside because there was already an existing business of people who bring you fresh ice blocks every day. It's just like $10 and you get a super huge crystal clear ice block. We don't have that in Germany, but they in developed a special technique to carve these eyes. And uh, Wenusan, for example, is taking out crystal clear eyes. He's having a knife and he's making you a Tiffany's diamond. So the eyes is becoming the form of a Tiffany's diamond. It fits 100% with this little in the tumbler. You fill in the whiskey on top, 
the cool thing is it's crystal clear, you don't see the ice anymore, because it's crystal clear. So you start drinking it and all of a sudden this diamond comes out. And pokes your eye out, oh my god. No. I just want to make you some more homework on this nerdy guy too, you know, like... L let me just say two things to that. Okay. One, even the Tokyo's Ginsan district is clearly in Japan, so I wasn't all wrong. And You're right. B, everything that has whiskey in it is definitely effective. I agree. But There's a whiskey efficient. drink coming in a minute or in a second. Yes, it's yeah, a very cool drink. It. It's um, because, you know, we are coming to the end, so it's a very strong drink. It's an effective drink, I have to say. Oh, and they pulled in very much of it. You have to be careful. <laughs> this is the technical knockout. So this is the recipe is five parts of very strong whiskey and two parts of some elderflower liquor. Nothing else. So both is alcohol. We are in a mission. <laughs> Yo, Doc, we heard you liked alcohol, so you put alcohol in your alcohol. <laughs> so you can drink while you drink. Wait. That didn't make sense. No, but still, we have some work to do, Mr. Bauer. I have a list of things we need to tell the people. So, first okay. of all, you are in Berlin tonight. You want to go out for drinks, maybe after the next after the, the three drinks. Beer and yes. Stuff. Uh, you decided you want to go to a classic bar. Maybe we made you interested in that. And you want to find a special place where you find special bartenders, special hospitality, special drinks. And we like to recommend you a little. So there is a bar, it's called Buck and Breck. Search it on your iPhone. It's a little bit hard to come inside. They just have 20 places and they are kind of restricted on this. And Don't go there with six or eight people, be two. That's okay. <laughs> Clever as a lady and a girl. Uh, a lady and a <laughs> uh, We need a definition of girl, so over 18 at least. <laughs> and uh, no, no. Um, that's bartender thinking, you know, two ladies, that's cool at the door, come in. Uh, oh. Black and Breck is even more nondescript than the Lyon. The Lyon at least has a sign, even though it's dark on yeah. black. And Buck and Breck is next to a police station, and you look on Google Maps, you're like, that's strange, should be here somewhere. And you look around, and there's nothing. There's something that looks like a hipster gallery place. And now nah, that's not it, that's a hipster gallery. And then by the third time you pass by, you see this little, little doorbell sign that just says bar. Okay, maybe that's it. And that's it. It's Gonzalo doing it. Regards to Gonzalo, it's amazing. So and then we have a very special bar I love very much. It's called Windhorst. And this is absolutely not a hipster place, it's very old school. And Günther Winters, an old guy, is doing it. And it's so unbelievable welcoming. They serve you small, great food, and he's doing amazing good drinks. There's nothing posh into it, but I love that to death. So Winters, highly recommend. It's a little bit bigger, you can fit in. With two ladies, at least. <laughs> so, I, put, I pull out another one. The next one is the next two ones. So this one, I have to say, this is very special. So if you're up for some borderline experience in a good way, because, don't get me wrong, I love the gentleman who is doing it, but he understands that our service industry is a stage, and he's performing on a very high level, and sometimes the level is not the level you may fit in tonight. Don't get me wrong, some of you will hate the bar immediately after you open the door, I have, to, I have to say, this gentleman, Gregor Scholl, which I really like, and he, the bar is called Ram Trader. You say this, I like it. <laughs> Did you like it? <laughs> so, for example, just give you a little bit the idea of what Gregor Scholl is about. He is the gentleman why we still are allowed to smoke in Germany. He was the guy, he was a Wait. regular of him, it's true. He went to the highest law court, and he made this decision going back in lots of the countries, because he said, a man has to smoke a cigar. Okay, so expect, it's yeah, very small, like uh, that's what he says, sorry. Planting a tree a bit, and stuff? Huh? Man has to plant a tree, father, child, build no, a house, No, he's more on cigar. cigars and rum, it's rum trader. And um, so Smoking go there, it's so very special. Love it or hate it, I just to give you a warning, but I love it. Okay, well, the next bar on our list is um, a Friedrichshain classic, I'd say. Uh, it's the Booze Bar. Some of you might have been there, I know. Um, and the Booze Bar is something that I think is very close to my, my ideal bar. It's maybe my, my preferred equivalent to the Lyon. It's also kind of betreutes trinken. That's, that, is their, that is their slogan. There's no shishi, no shisha, no whatever, nothing fancy. We have good drinks and that's it. Um, at the same time, if you go there and try to order something that knocks me out, 
quote. I'm looking at you, Jenna, even though you're not looking at me. Um, they'll just say, oh, no, we don't do that here, sorry. That's okay. But they're great fun. So Boost Bar, Friedrich Sein on Boxhagener Straße, really nice, lots of seats, so you can all go there if you want. And yeah, highly recommended. They also have a lightsaber. Ask about the lightsaber and enjoy. What's the lightsaber? <laughs> and yeah, it's a good way May to, the force to keep be with poor. you. I see, I see. Yeah, and finally, also in Friedrichshain, uh, which is just a coincidence and has nothing to do with me living there, um, the Antlet Bunny at Oderplatz. It is amazing. The entire bar is about as big as the stage, maybe a little smaller. Um, so don't go all, please, don't go yeah, all. <laughs> maybe, maybe you and you. Um, and it's next to, to a cafe called Aunt Benny. And they had this, this um, side room unused. And so they met this bartender, but it's like, hey, you have the side room? They're like, yeah, we have the side room. They're like, why don't we make a bar out of that? And they're like, okay. And if you, you can go there and you can get liquid happiness. It's um, lots of the classics, of course, but also a, a varying selection of really quite crazy creations sometimes. Um, I went there once and I had a cookies and cream cocktail. That was um, close to Christmas, I think. I don't remember what was in it, but I know it had cookie dough and chocolate pieces in the drink, and it was fucking amazing. So yeah, definitely recommend it. But please go there in small groups. So this is for tonight, but um, maybe you don't go to a bar tonight because you stay at this bar very long, I like that. Uh, we, have, we have to give some drinks to the Technic guys again. We have to make them happy. Hello, my friends. Hello, we need drinks for the back. Could we, could we maybe lock the door so no organizers come in? We make our private party. Can you put on some music? I like that. So, um, Actually, can we get music on the headphones? Can we do like oh, a we can headphone make a headphone disco. That's cool. Can we make a headphone disco? I think okay. hardcore vibes would be cool. Huh? <laughs> okay, so mo you say more tips? Tips, yeah, we tip for them as well. We tip for you, man. Um, you so, go, um, but if you go home after a very long night at stage four, and uh, you wake up two days later, and uh, you decide that, man, that was really cool. I want to become a home bartender. I want to impress my, you know, friends, and I want to show off. I like that. So you can write me an email. I try to answer. It's like uh, askyork.com, something like that. <laughs> and oh, ask you know, we, should, we should totally do that. You can set Ask that up immediately. So can, some, can somebody? You can register that. Gonna I pay you for that? Uh, so can you? Okay, I like that. <laughs> Tell me what's the annual fees? I pay you directly out. Um, but uh, we are in service industry. Please add twenty percent tips or something like that. Um, so two things we like to recommend. Cheers. There's one. No, that there's when you are really, you know, when you concentrate drinking this, clothing your eyes, drinking it, enjoying it, swallowing it, you immediately get a very small hint somewhere in your back here of elderflower. That's an amazing elderflower liquor. The th the thing is, it's maybe more important, more uh, more expensive than the whiskey. That's why we are so, you know, we don't put too much in it. Now Buttons I like up. it when it's strong on the whiskey side. So. Um, Two blocks we want to recommend. One is Jeffrey Morgenthaler from Oregon. JeffreyMorgenthaler.com. Have a look at this blog. It's amazing for home bartenders. He is a bartender. He's great. He's, he's crazy. He's, he's writing everything. It's amazing. Yeah. If you ever wanted to know how to create perfect ice cubes. Nope. The ice cube is the other guy. No, no. He all, no, no, wait. Ah, okay, okay. <laughs> okay. No, he's right. If you ever wanted to know how to create very good ice cubes, that's uh, your go-to guy. Or if you wanted to carbonate your own drinks, that's your go-to guy. Or if you want to, I don't know, age something in really old barrels for 50,000 years, that's your go-to guy. For sure, you need to do this. Buy a barrel and age your drink. And uh, there's another guy, it's called, um, uh, the, the blog is called Alkademix. He will put out the links in a, I'm gonna tweet maybe this. two hours when the party is over here. Alkademix.com. And he's like him, he's a trainee. He's a perfect guy, he's obsessed with ice. He's writing everything about how you can create crystal clear ice in your home because that is not so easy. Many people fail on this. When you have a very special expensive machine, you can make crystal clear ice, but it's not easy. We love you!
Wir brauchen ein paar Drinks, ein Tablet, sechs Drinks. Can you take over? I need to get them drinks. You have to tell a little bit things. Okay, um, I have to tell you something. Okay, so yeah, that is your go-to guy. It's for all about the technique, eyes. guys. <laughs> I need. To, I don't know. Wait. You have to talk a little bit. I need a headphone. Thank you very much. Okay, that is definitely not hardcore vibes. We need a little bit more, like, like we have some what? I don't know, Michael That's Jackson or Aretha Franklin Gangnam style something or something. Oh, can I bring it to the... You know, that, that music makes me very small. Can we... Ah. Now we are talking. I think yeah, if you want to go, if you want to stand up and dance, we can stop here as well and we open the bar. How you like we that? We have a light show! Come on, go to the bar. We open the bar right now. We pull out gin and tonics as far as we have. We bought 20 bottles. Go for it. I come in a minute. No, that's what it takes. Take your fingers off! <laughs> Available the offers last. Go to the bar now. That's for the technique, friends. We're just going to tweet about the rest of the tips for tonight. That's for English uh, Proto Techno. Okay, okay, that's, that's fine. So, ladies and gentlemen, we stop our talk right here. It's 9 o'clock. We shouldn't bother you with boring history. We want to make drinks for you. Come to the bar, be our friend, start dancing. Welcome to the Festival of the Digital Society. The bar is open. Yes. We, this is Andre and Magdalena, special applause for Andre and Magdalena! Gin tonic, Andre. If you ask me, you can turn the volume up. Bar is here, we go there. This is our bar, you go back. We take. 